The Fed has made a complete 180. And no, I'm not talking about transitory inflation. Back in 2023, the Federal Reserve Bank said that a mild recession was, quote, the base case for our economy. Since then, not only has the Fed canceled their recession forecast, but they're taking it one step further now. According to the Fed, there is no recession coming in 2024 and beyond. The Fed now expects economic growth in 2024, 2025, and 2026 to be even stronger than they previously thought. Now, it's pretty easy to see why the Federal Reserve Bank is saying this. The housing market has been booming. The stock market has been booming. Gold prices have been booming. And even Bitcoin has been booming. So let's do this. Let's break down what's going on in the economy, the housing market, the stock market, and then Bitcoin and gold, and talk about what this means for your wallet and where the opportunities are. Now, as a quick reminder, on April 2nd, 2024, I'm hosting a live, free, and virtual real estate investing workshop where I'm going to be going over my own real estate investing strategies on how I find a good location to invest in, how I find a good property that's going to cash flow by running the numbers, and then how I maximize the profits as an investor. This is a free workshop, so if you've been thinking about investing your money in real estate or you want to see how you can do your next real estate deal even better, well, come join me on this workshop for free. I got the link for you down in the description below. Just make sure you register soon because there's a limited number of people that can join me live. Now, to understand what's really going on in our economy, you have to understand what moves our economic system. So let's say I walk into McDonald's, I open up my wallet and take out this crispy $100 bill, go to the cashier and I say, you know what, let me get a Big Mac. Actually, cancel that. I don't want anything. And then I walk out. Now, it's not a big deal if I'm the only person doing that. But let's assume now that every person that walks into McDonald's does that same thing. Every person walks in, they take some money out, but they say, you know what, I'm not going to give you any money. And then they walk out. Well, now this McDonald's store is not going to make any money. And for a little while, it might not be a big deal because this McDonald's franchise probably has some cash savings so they can continue paying the salaries, they can continue paying the rent, and they can continue funding their expenses out of their own pocket. But eventually, if people keep coming in and they don't spend any money, well, then this store is eventually going to go out of business because then the owners of this store are going to say, you know what, this store is not working. They have to let go of the employees. We have to fire the employees. We have to get rid of this building so we can stop paying rent or stop paying our mortgage. And we need to stop paying these expenses because we're not making any money. But now, if people were coming in and people were buying a whole bunch of food, well, now the store can continue to operate. Maybe they'll hire more employees. Maybe they'll even open up another McDonald's right down the street because of how much money is coming into this business. So our economic system runs on spending. The more money you spend, the more money somebody else makes. And so when our economy is booming, that means people are spending money. Well, consumers spent a record amount of money in 2023, and they are still spending money like crazy in 2024. This is great news for the economy because it keeps the machine moving. But the risk here and the concern here is how are people actually spending this money? Well, in 2023, we also saw a record number of Americans pull money out of the 401ks through a hardship withdrawal so they could continue spending. In fact, nearly 3.6% of workers participating in an employer-sponsored 401k made a so-called hardship withdrawal in 2023, which is the highest level since Vanguard began tracking this data in 2004. That means more people were pulling money out of the 401ks in 2023 to fund their expenses than 2008 during the Great Recession. We also saw credit card debt hit a fresh record high in 2023. And in the case of credit cards, it looks like things have reverted to a level that is worse than pre-pandemic. And of course, don't forget about buy now, pay later, or as I like to call it, broke now, broke later. Apparel and accessories were the most popular product category amongst millennials and Gen Zers as users for buy now, pay later. So that means our economy has been booming because people are spending money. But the way people are getting this money isn't just from their income. They're getting this money from their credit cards. They're getting this money from the 401ks and they're getting this money from other sorts of financing like buy now pay later which means people might not be spending within their means which is fine in the short term but that could create issues in the long run if people eventually run out of this ability to spend if people lose their incomes not only do they lose their income but they lose their credit ability to spend and it's very risky on the consumer to continue just spending money that you don't have on things that aren't actually making you money so the economy is booming but there are those risks to the economy which brings us to number two what's going on in the housing market now although i almost failed my economics class back in college because it didn't make any sense to me home prices run on supply and demand what that means is when you have more buyers than sellers, more demand than supply, that pushes home prices up because now you have a whole bunch of people bidding for one home. But on the flip side, when you have more supply than demand, more sellers than buyers, this pulls home prices lower because now the home sellers are competing against each other for that one buyer. 
How do home sellers compete against each other when you have very few buyers? Well, they cut their prices. So what we're seeing today at the time of recording this video is more people are listing their homes for sale, which means that supply is starting to rise a little bit. But this increase in inventory of homes for sale that we've seen is nowhere near enough because we're still facing the supply shortage around the country. There are a lot of people that don't want to sell their homes because they're saying, I have a 3% mortgage. Why would I want to sell my home today and then go and get a 7% mortgage somewhere else? So I'll just stay in my home. Not to mention, we don't really have any foreclosures happening because home prices have gone up so much. So if somebody is facing a financial hardship, if they lost their jobs, well, chances are you still can sell your home for a profit and walk away with some cash if you don't have the ability to make your mortgage, which is why you're still not seeing that many foreclosures. So on the supply side, we have seen supply move a little bit upwards, but it's still relatively low. And on the opposite side, we still have strong demand because that sticker shock of people saying, oh my God, a 7% mortgage is kind of gone now. So we still have high demand. Is it as high as it was when we had 3% mortgages out there? No, but demand is still high. So I guess we could say relative to a couple of years ago, demand has fallen a little bit, but we still have high demand. So what does that mean? Two or three years ago, we had demand way up here and supply way down here. Today, we have demand down here and supply up here. It's more closer to an equilibrium, but we still have more demand than supply, which is why still in many neighborhoods around the country, you have bidding wars and you have a lot of buyers still struggling to find a home. That's why home prices are still rising in many neighborhoods, but not every neighborhood because real estate is very localized. The Midwestern United States. Yes, Michigan is one of the hottest housing markets right now. I'll take that shout out for Detroit. And at the same time, those cities that boomed during the pandemic are actually seeing their home prices fall right now. For example, the median sales price for a home in Austin, Texas fell 16% between May 2022 and May 2023. So if we're speaking generally around the country, we've seen supply generally move up a little bit and demand move down a little bit. But then you have certain pockets of the country, for example, Austin, Texas, and some other cities that were booming during the pandemic. Well, in those cities, we're seeing demand fall a little bit more aggressively while supply is rising a little bit more aggressively versus other places like the Midwest, shout out Detroit, where you're still seeing prices rise because now you have still more demand than supply. So real estate is localized, but remember supply and demand is what influences price, which brings us now to number three, what's going on in the stock market? The S&P 500 is up around 10% year to date, and it's up around 80% over just the last five years. Now remember, the S&P 500 is an index, meaning it's a group of the 500 largest companies on the stock market. But what's more interesting about that is that this big run-up in the stock market, particularly the S&P 500, is weighted very heavily by just nine stocks. In fact, you can attribute 40% of this S&P 500 gain to just nine stocks, which stocks Microsoft, Nvidia, Apple, and a few others. Now, if you've watched any of my stock market investing videos, you might've heard me talk about how I've been investing my money passively into the S&P 500 using some ETFs. Now, I'm not telling you what to invest in. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just talking about what I do. Well, what that means is over the last few years, I've seen a big run up in these ETFs because of the growth in the S&P 500. However, this has also caused some concern because some people like Michael Burry has called this an index fund bubble because people are just putting their money passively into to funds that are giving you exposure to things like the S&P 500 because of this very situation where you have some stocks that are really heavily weighting up the S&P 500, but then you have stocks like number 498 in the S&P 500, which many people have no idea what it is that's getting money because it's just part of this index. It's a part of the S&P 500. And this is where some people are also concerned that this could potentially be creating a bubble. Now, the way that I look at it is I'm investing my money for the long term. So I understand market crashes happen. And when market crashes happen, they create opportunity for me to come in and invest even more aggressively because I'm investing for the long term. I'm not investing for two years, I'm investing for decades. So when a market crash happens, because I know market crashes do happen, they've happened in the past and they will continue to happen in the future, they create opportunity for me to come in and invest even more aggressively because I'm not looking to just hold on to my stocks for two years. And I know investing has risks and you're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money, which is why you should always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. Now, right before I recorded this video, me and some of my content team at Briefs Media were having a discussion. These are some of the team members that write market briefs, and we always try to have these discussions as a way to provoke thoughts and help create creativity while we write. And one of the discussion points that I was asking is, when you see the markets boom, like we've been seeing, is it good or bad? And we talked about it. What about when we see markets crash? Is it good or bad? 
And one of the things that we were talking about is essentially, it depends who you ask. When the markets are booming, it's good for people that own that asset, but not so good for people that don't own that asset. Because now if you want to buy stocks and stocks are more expensive, it's going to cost you more money to buy those stocks. If home prices are booming, it's great if you own a home, but not so good if you want to own a home because now it's going to cost you more money to own a home and your rent might be more expensive. Likewise, is a market crash good or bad? Depends who you ask. If you own stocks and stocks are crashing, not so good. But if you want to buy stocks and stocks are crashing and you have cash, it's great. If the housing market is crashing and you own a home and you're underwater, it's bad. If the housing market's crashing, but you have cash and you want to buy a home, it's great. And this is where I want you to understand that things happen in the economy, good and bad, and they create opportunities, good and bad. And you want to be the one that can find the opportunities, but that requires you to be financially educated and also be financially prepared, meaning you have cash to protect you, not just against an emergency, but also to be able to invest. And these are some of the things that we talk about in Market Briefs, which by the way, is my free financial newsletter. You can join that by going to briefs.co slash market. But this brings me now to the topic of Bitcoin and gold, because what we've been seeing is this interesting boom in both Bitcoin prices and gold prices. Now, what's interesting with this gold rush and this Bitcoin rush is you have a lot of people that are Bitcoin enthusiasts who hate Bitcoin. And then you have a lot of people who are Bitcoin enthusiasts who hate gold. And just so you know where I'm coming from, I own physical gold. I also own some Bitcoin. And I also sold some Bitcoin recently as well. But although most people who are buying gold and most people who are buying Bitcoin don't get along with one another, they both kind of have the same mindset in that they're both worried about the dollar losing value to inflation. And because they're worried about the dollar losing value to inflation, they're turning to this hedge. Some people are turning to Bitcoin, other people are turning to gold. So they're kind of buying these assets almost for the same reasons, although there are some differences, but they don't often like each other. Now, physical gold itself is unique because gold has been a hedge for all of time. The people have used physical gold as a means of currency. And so it is time tested and people know that people value gold in India, in Mexico, in the United States and Canada, that people around the world know what gold is. Bitcoin is now starting to gain the popularity and Bitcoin has been booming, especially recently because of this new Bitcoin ETF boom that has really entered the markets. In fact, Michael Saylor and BlackRock have been competing as to who is going to own the most Bitcoin. Michael Saylor, for those of you who don't know, is one of the biggest and loudest enthusiasts for Bitcoin. Now, of course, there's different uses for Bitcoin that you don't have for gold. And I'm not going to get into all of that in this video. But what the point I want you to get and understand here is that people are buying Bitcoin and gold for similar reasons. Now, Bitcoin is much more speculative than physical gold. Bitcoin is a part of my speculative piece of my portfolio. Gold is a piece of my hedge portfolio. When I buy gold, I don't look at it as an investment. When I buy gold, I do it as an alternative way to save. It's a way for me to save hard money. When I buy Bitcoin for me, this is a speculative investment. I look at it as a speculative investment that I understand that it can go straight down to zero. I know the risk and I'm comfortable with that, which is why I buy it with that intention in mind. It is not a huge piece of my portfolio. I know that this is speculative. Gold is a way for me to save hard money. So I, I look at it from different perspectives, but both of these have seen a rush of dollars moving in. And a big reason for both of that is because people are still worried about inflation because even today we're seeing inflation numbers that are hotter than expected, which have driven the values of both of these assets up as well. And at the same time, we've also been seeing the growth of institutional dollars enter things like Bitcoin, which is one of the reasons why Bitcoin prices have been booming as well. So now when we look at all this together, we've seen the economy boom. Why is the economy booming? Because people are spending money, but there are some red flags there because some people are running out of money. And this economic system is what then fuels the housing market because people need an income to go out and buy a home and people need an income to make their mortgage payments. This economic system is what fuels the stock market because number one, companies are what trade on the stock market. And if companies are making money, well, then people want to invest in the stock and people also need money to go out and buy stocks. So if people have money to invest in stocks and if people have money to spend at companies that can fuel the stock market. And this is also what fuels the Bitcoin and gold boom because people need money to go out and buy Bitcoin and they need money to go out and buy gold at the end of the day. So right now we have the strong economy today, which is fueling all of this. However, you want to pay attention to this. Pay attention to what the Federal Reserve Bank is doing. Pay attention to what's going on with interest rates. Pay attention to what's going on with unemployment rates and pay attention to what's going on with economic growth because nothing can go straight up forever. Now, no one knows when the economy is going to slow down, but we do know that it will eventually happen. We've seen a recession happen in the United States pretty much every decade for the last century. 
This is just a fact. And so now if we know this happens, well, we know at some point in the future, we don't know if it's 2025 or 2035, but we know at some point in the future, we will see some sort of economic slowdown. So when that happens, you can bet that that's gonna impact housing, it's gonna impact stocks and impact Bitcoin and gold. Now, what does this mean for you? Does this mean you shouldn't be investing? No. It means you just got to understand what's going on. And when the things go down, you have cash to come in and invest even more aggressively. What Warren Buffett says is that time in the market beats time in the market. Because nobody can predict what's going to happen in the markets tomorrow. If you're sitting there waiting, 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 waiting for the markets to crash, well, you might be waiting for years and you might miss years of upside versus if you keep continually investing and then you see a market crash, that creates an opportunity for you to come in and invest even more aggressively. And this is where your financial education is very important when you're investing because number one, you need to know how to invest and the psychology of investing. But then number two, you also wanna know what it is that you're investing in. Because the second problem is people will be investing into bad assets and then markets will go down, the economy will go down and their investment might go bust. Maybe because they had too much debt, maybe because they invested into a bad asset, which is now bankrupt, and so then you can lose everything. So this is where your financial education is important, but also understanding what it is that you're investing in and how you're investing, that way you can balance these two things together. Now, these are things, of course, I'll be covering on our channel, but if you want to learn more about investing your money in real estate, you can join me on my workshop. I got the link for you down in the description below. Jamie Dimon just said that Wall Street is too hopeful that our economy is going to avoid a recession and see a soft landing. Jamie Dimon, for those of you who don't know, is a CEO of the largest bank in the United States. And just recently, he did an interview with CNBC where he said that he thinks investors are too hopeful about our economy in the United States 